Okay, so, so far we've been talking about first order logic and its syntax and semantics. And now what we would like to do is we would talk, like to talk about inference rules for first order logic. In this module, we are going to be talking about modus ponens when we have only horn clauses. And then in the next module, we are going to be talking about resolution when, when it comes to first order logic. Okay. All right. So if you remember what inference rules do is they basically do symbol manipulation. So they take the formulas, the syntactic form of the formulas, and they have like no notion of meanings or anything of that form. But based on the formulas that are in knowledge base, they basically try to infer, they try to derive or prove a new formula based on what exists by syntactically moving things around, kind of like what we have seen in modus ponens for propositional logic, right? So what we would like to do is we would like to focus on applying modus ponens to first order logic when we are under a scenario where we are have only horn clauses. And if you remember horn clauses, we were definite clauses and goal clauses and definite clauses were of the form of having some, some set of prepositional symbols. So P and Q, for example, implying P, P1 and P2, for example, implying some, some Q. So some positive literals ended with each other, implying a new positive literal. So how do we extend that idea of definite clause to the space of first order logic? So if you want to look at definite clauses in first order logic, we are going to have a set of variables and we are going to have quantifiers on top of them. So for example, we are, this is an example of a definite clause where we talk about for all x, for all y, for all z. And then we have these predicates takes x and y uh, and it with another predicate covers y and z, and that implies a whole new predicate knows x and z. Okay, so we have kind of like these atomic formulas ended with each other, and we have we have a set of quantifiers outside and this implication. Okay. So basically, if you propositionalize here, we get one formula for each value of x, x, y, and z. So 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 if you remember propositionalization from the from the last module, what we can do is we can basically think about x, y, and z taking specific values like x being Alice and y being CS to 21 and z being MDP. And if you think about each one of these values, like each one of these formulas, taking one value for, uh, for each x, for each y, and for each z, and then we end up with a propositional logic formula that ends up being actually definite clauses. But we would like to be able to represent this in this more expressive way. And, and because of that, we're defining definite clauses in first order logic using these variables and using these quantifiers and so on. So more formally, a definite clause has the following form. So, so it has this form of having a for all quantifier for x1 for all, through for all xn, where x1 and xn through xn are variables. And, and, and we have these atomic formulas, A1 through AK and B, all of these are atomic formulas, and we are ending these atomic formulas, A1 through AK, and that implies B. And remember, these atomic formulas actually contain these variables, X1 through Xn. So, so they, are, they actually have X1 through Xn inside of them contain them. Okay, kind of like this example up here. All right, so this is a definite clause in first order logic. So how can we do modus ponens in, in first order logic, okay? So if this is a definite clause for all x1 through xn, a1 and a through ak implies b, one possible attempt, maybe our first attempt in looking at modus ponens is we have this, and in addition to that, maybe in our knowledge base, we have a1 through ak, and based on that, we should be able to derive b. Based on these premises, maybe we can conclude b. So does this work? Does this, does this definition of modus ponens work? Let's look at an example. So it turns out that it actually doesn't work. So, so let's look at this example where, where we have P of Alice. So P is a predicate over Alice, and maybe that defines our A1. And then we say, for all X, P of X implies Q of X, okay? And ideally, what should I get from this? Ideally, I would like to get Q of B from this. But I'm really not able to do that. Well, why am I not able to do that? Because remember, modus ponens is an inference rule. Inference rules don't really know anything about semantics or meanings. So they're basically just matching symbols. And if I'm just matching symbols, first off, P of Alice has nothing to do with P of X. So I can't really match P of Alice and P of X. So I'm kind of like screwed. I can't, like this, I can't apply this modus ponens idea on top of it. And then in addition to that, if I, even if like I could somehow say P of Alice and P of X are the same thing, I, I'm not gonna be able to get Q, uh, here Q of Alice because Q of, Q of Alice and Q of X are very different things. So I can't infer Q of Alice 
And then I also can't really like match P of X and P of Vs. They don't really match here. So this modus ponens, like the rule that I've written here, just doesn't work. This is not the modus ponens that we should be using in first order logic. So how are we going to solve this? So there are two ideas that I'm going to be talking about in this module, substitution and unification. And substitution and unification are the things that are going to make our, improve our modus ponens and help us apply modus ponens in first order logic. So let's look at what they are. So what is substitution? So what substitution does is it takes a substitution rule that substitutes a variable with a term and it takes a formula and it basically takes that formula and substitutes all those variables with those terms that it is given. Okay. One thing to notice is it's going to substitute a variable like x with, with a term. And what is a term? If you remember our, our module on syntax of first order logic, a term is going to be either a constant symbol or another variable or a function. Okay. So here in this example, Alice is a constant symbol. So I'm replacing a variable x with a constant symbol Alice. Here's another example. So I'm, I'm substituting x with Alice, and I'm substituting y with z with another variable. In this formula, p of x and k of x and y. Okay, so, so I'm doing find and replace. Basically, I'm doing find x, replace it by Alice, find x, replace it by Alice, find y, replace it by z. And, and, and that is what substitution does. So a substitution theta, it's a mapping from variables to terms, and substitute theta f returns basically the result of performing that substitution on a formula f, okay? All right, so what does unification do? So that was substitution, that's great. So what does unification do? So what unification does is it takes two formulas and it tries to match them as closely as possible. And unification returns a substitution rule that tries to match those formulas as close as possible. So if I'm doing unify, knows Alice arithmetic and knows X arithmetic, I have these two formulas. I try to match them as close as possible. And the substitution rule that matches these as close as possible is replace the variable X by Alice. Okay, so, so that is what I'm gonna return. Let's look at another example. So I might have unify knows Alice Y and knows X Z. Okay, so what is a substitution rule that gets me there? I'm going to get a substitution rule that says, Re replace x variable x by Alice, replace variable y by z. And, and that is going to be the substitution rule that I'll get out of unifying these two formulas. Here's another example. So I have unify knows Alice y and knows Bob z. So this is going to return fail. And the reason it's going to re return fail is I'm not going to be able to substitute a symbol, uh, a constant symbol by another constant symbol. Remember, we are substituting variables by terms, and there are no variables here to substitute. There are two, there are two constant symbols, there are two terms, right? So, so I'm not going to be able to substitute these, so I'm going to get failed from unification here. And here is another example. So I might have knows Alice and Y and knows X and F of X, a function here, right? So, so here a substitution rule is take the variable X, replace it by Alice, and takes variable Y, and replace it by f of Alice. So I'm taking the most general form of this, where I could have f of x here, but because I've already, I already know in my substitution rule that x needs to be replaced by Alice, instead of putting f of x here, I'm putting f of Alice. I've already like replaced x by Alice. Okay. So what is unification? Well, what does it do more formally? It takes two formulas, f and g, and it returns a substitution, which is the most general form of a unifier. So, so unify f and g two formulas, return a theta. So then if I, if I do substitution of theta in f, that gives me the same thing as substitution of theta in g. And it returns fail if such a, such, such a substitution doesn't exist. So why am I defining these? So the reason I'm defining unification and substitution is I can now modify my modus ponens and I can use this idea of substitution and unification in order to make modus ponens work in first order logic. So here I'm going to have different A1 prime through AK prime, these atomic formulas from A1 through AK and different B prime than B. These are going to be different atomic formulas. Specifically, if you think about it, these A1 prime through AK prime are, are groundings of this A1 through AK, which basically operate on, on, on these, these uh, variables Xs. And B again operates on a, on a variable on X and B prime, you can think of it as a grounding of B. Okay? 
And then B prime and B or A1 prime through AK prime, they don't look the same, right? So that's why I can syntactically just like replace them by each other. But what I can do is I can use substitution and unification. What I can do is first off, I can look at my A1 prime through AK prime, my groundings, and then these other atomic formulas, A1 through AK, and I can unify them. So once I unify them, I get a substitution rule theta. And what I can do is I can, I can derive B prime. And what is B prime? B prime is going to be the result of substituting theta in B. And that is going to be my new mode exponents rule. Okay, so I'll end up getting a grounded version of B, B prime. And how do I get that? By substituting theta in B. And where do I get theta? I get theta by unifying A1 prime through AK prime and A1 through AK. Okay, let's look at an example. So let's say that in my knowledge base, I have a premise that says Alice takes CS to 21. So this is my first version, A1 prime, which is a grounded version uh, of X taking Y. And then I have CS to 21 covers MDP. Again, it's a grounded version of Y taking Z. So what I do is first I do a unification of, of, of these two formulas and these two formulas. And based on that unification, I'm going to get a substitution rule. That substitution rule tells me that take variable x, replace it by Alice, take variable b, sorry, take, take, and take variable y, replace it by CS221, variable z, replace it by MDP. And then what am I going to derive? What am I going to return out of mode exponents? Mode exponents basically tells me that this is your b. You want to return kind of a modified version of b. And what is that modified version? That modified ver version is using this substitution rule over your B, over, over this nose XC. So if I, if I substitute theta in nose XC, I'm going to get Alice knows MDP. And that is the thing I'm going to be returning. That is the thing that I'm going to be deriving here or, or proving here. And that's basically applying mode exponents in first order logic. So let's think about the complexity of this. Is this, is this how is it, the time complexity here? And, and how, how, how bad is this? So if you remember, when we're doing mode exponents in propositional logic, every time we're running mode exponents, we were adding one, we were adding one propositional, uh, propositional symbol right, in, in, in the propositional logic line. Here, every time you're running mode exponents, you're only adding one atomic formula, which is, which is not bad, which is actually pretty good. And in addition to that, if you don't have any functions, right? If, if, if there are no functions going on here, then the number of these atomic formulas is at most the number of constant symbols that we have to the power of maximum predicate arity. So, so in this example, for example, I might have P of X, Y, and Z, and maybe X takes 100 values, Y takes 100 values, and Z takes 100 values. So then I'm going to get 100 to the power of 3 here, which is, which is not bad. But the thing is, if there are functions here, then we actually end up with an with in, in, with infinite number of them being applied to each other. So this becomes unbounded. So if I have, if I have a function over A, I can keep applying that. And then I end up with an infinite number of things being added in because I can keep applying the function on it. On it, on it. So remember, like for example, the sum uh, function that we saw like earlier in one of the examples, we had sum of three and x, right? So I can keep applying sum on top of each other, on top of itself, and almost like recreate like arithmetic by applying sum on itself. But what we are going to get an unbounded number of formulas here, which is not that great. Okay. All right, what else do we know about mode exponents? So, so the thing with uh, mode exponents in this space of first order logic. So what we know is mode exponents turns out to be complete for, for first order logic with only horn clauses. This is a similar type of completeness that we have uh, when, when, we look at, uh, when we look at mode exponents in propositional logic. Again, if we are limited to horn clauses, we have completeness in first order logic as well. In addition to that, we know that first order logic, only when it is, even only when it is restricted to horn clauses, is semi-decidable. So, so what does that mean? What that means is, if that, is that if our knowledge base entails f, and then we want to figure out if it entails f or not, but if it actually entails f, and we keep doing forward inference, we keep trying to derive an, a new formula until convergence, uh, using mode exponents, this forward in inference until kind of like complete in until we get like these complete inference rules and and getting f takes finite time. So so if my knowledge base actually entails f, I should be able to derive f in finite time. I should be able to prove f by just inference rules in finite time, which is pretty nice. 
But with the difficulty that gets me the semi-decidability is if knowledge base doesn't entail F, and I might not know if knowledge base entails F or doesn't entail F, right? Like if I don't know, and actually knowledge base doesn't entail F, it turns out that there are no algorithms that can show this in finite time, okay? So, so and, and this is actually kind of related to a halting problem. So, so there actually people have shown that there is like no algorithms that, that could do this in finite time, and we are kind of screwed in that case. So in general, this is not too bad. In general, you can, you can think about having a budget for the amount of time that you're going to run your inference rule and run it on, and, and see if, if you get lucky and, and, and KB actually entails F, you're going to be able to get F in finite time. So, so you could actually run uh, first uh, mode exponents with first order logic when you have horn causes. And, and, and it, does, it does work in some instances when, when KB actually entails F. But then in the next module, what we'd like to talk about is you want to go beyond mode exponents and you want to talk about resolution, specifically how resolution would work in first order logic.